Welcome to the reproductive system. There it is, reproductive system screencast. Um, this will most likely get divided up into two videos. We'll see what happens. Uh, we are going to start just by defining some terms. Uh, so the primary sex organs, or I should say the origin of the reproductive cells are the gonads. So testes in males, ovaries in, se in females. Um, as I said, these organs produce the reproductive or the sex cells, which we call gametes, eggs in females, sperm in males. And the gonads produce the gonadal hormones, testosterone in males, and estrogen and progesterone in females. Um, we'll start with a quick run through the male reproductive system because we do it in lab as well. Um, so we're, we're just going to go through relatively quickly and basically follow the pathway that sperm take on their way through the body hitting the major accessory organs. Um, so we start in the testes. The testes um, look like this. They are filled with what are called seminiferous tubules. So all of these little blue tubes are seminiferous tubules. If you zoom in on one, uh, this is what it looks like in, in a black and white micrograph. Outside of the seminiferous tubules here, down in the corner here, and in other places, those are the interstitial cells or Leydig cells, I call them interstitial cells, you want to remember that that is the source of testosterone. Um, also within the scrotal sac next to the testes is the epididymis. So you may recall from lab, or actually we haven't done lab yet, um, that uh, the sperm that are produced in the seminiferous tubules are morphologically mature but not physiologically mature. So they do not become motile or able to swim until they spend some time in the epididymis. So we're going to have testes for sperm, sperm production, epididymis for sperm maturation. Um, then during ejaculation the ductus deferens is going to contract um, and the sperm will run through the ductus deferens and into the urethra. Those two structures we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about. We are next going to hit um, three of the male accessory reproductive glands starting with this yellow one here which is usually about the size of a walnut called the prostate. Um, it secretes um, as it says here, a milky fluid. Um, what we are going to concentrate on is enzymes. I'm not sure what the citrate does, um, but what these enzymes do is sort of physiologically wake up the sperm, right? So if, if they were to be swimming around all the time in the epididymis, they would waste a lot of energy and your body is tuned to um, save energy as much as it can. So even though the sperm know how to swim, have the ability in the epididymis, they are generally um, quiescent or kind of sleepy when they're in the epididymis and the enzymes in the prostatic fluid just wake them up. Um, the seminal vesicles dump um, their contribution to the ejaculate into the ejaculatory duct right here about the same time sperm are showing up. Um, so here, right, this is supposed to be your vas deferens and here's your seminal vesicle which is going to squirt seminal fluid into the ejaculatory duct at the same time that the sperm are being propelled there by the vas deferens. So what the seminal fluid contains is uh, first important thing is to know that it is alkaline. This neutralizes the female urogenital mucosa. And the second important thing for us is to know that it contains fructose. Um, so your sperm are vanishingly small. You basically want to think of them as a nucleus with a propulsion device on them. Um, very little, if any, cytoplasm. 
so they don't have the room to store a lot of glucose or starch. Um, they simply have the nucleus and a lot of mitochondria at the base of the tail, um, but their energy they have to get externally and that's what the fructose is there for. Then you have this one gland that we did not talk about in lecture, um, which is right here. Um, it is called the bobo urethral gland. It used to be Cowper's gland. We've renamed it. Um, and this gland is active during excitation and intercourse. So prior to ejaculation or climax, it produces a thick, clear mu mucus that neutralizes any acid from urine that might be left over in the urethra. And then your ejaculate is just a combination of all of these different glandular secretions along with the sperm themselves. Um, so now we get into making sperm and making eggs. Um, so sperm and eggs, as we said before, collectively are called gametes. So the process of making sperm and eggs, we are going to call gametogenesis. Um, before we talk specifically about gametogenesis, we just have to identify or define some terms when it comes to counting chromosome numbers. So every human adult or every human adult with the normal, um, the normal number of chromosomes has two pairs of 23 chromosomes. So here is chromosome number one. These two chromosomes should look pretty much the same. They're not in the same shape, but they have all of the same genes on them. So every gene that you find on this chromosome, you find on this chromosome and in the same order. So you've got one chromosome number one from mom, one chromosome number one from dad, all the way up to 22 and then the 23rd chromosomes are the sex chromosomes here you have an x which would have to come from mom and the y would have come from dad why you ask because y is what makes males males um, so females are xx males are xy so we know that this x came from mom and that y came from dad um, so we call the normal number or the uh, number of chromosomes that your somatic or body cells have, we call the diploid number because there's two copies of each chromosome. Um, so the diploid number in humans is 46. So that is 2n or 2 times 23 chromosomes. Um, the n number then we refer to as the haploid number. Um, which is not on there. So let me add it, parentheses, haploid. I think that comes up later. So when you are making sperm, you want your sperm and eggs, when you're making gametes, you want your gametes to be haploid. So you want n number of chromosomes in the egg and n number of chromosomes in the sperm so that when N chromosomes and N chromosomes get together in an embryo, all of the resulting cells in that embryo have the original 2N number of embryos. So when we're making egg or making sperm, the most important thing we have to do is cut the number of chromosomes in half from 46 to 23 or from the 2N diploid number of chromosomes to the N haploid number of chromosomes. Um, the way that this happens, or the process, is called meiosis. Um, it is similar to mitosis, but with a couple of important twists. Um, so basically, how I want you to think about meiosis is that you have one round of DNA replication, followed by two cell divisions. Right. So you start out with enough DNA to make two cells, but then you're going to divide twice and end up with four cells, which will then each have one half of the number of chromosomes. So you're going to go from two copies of each chromosome to 
one copy of each chromosome. Um, so as I have it shown here, right, it's 2n, but it's 2 times 2n because you go through replication. Um, so now you've functionally you've got four copies of each chromosome here. When you make four cells, that gives you enough copies to do one copy of each chromosome per cell. So you go from 2 times 2n to 2 times 1n. This part is not important. Um, so that you end up with four daughter cells that each have the one n number of chromosomes. So this does two important things. One, it halves the, cuts in half the number of chromosomes, um, but it also induces genetic variation. And it does so through two ways. Um, one is just that what you're passing down to your progeny is going to be some of your mother's chromosomes and some of your father's chromosomes. So you're kind of mixing up the deck a little bit there. Um, but there's even more mixing that takes place, um, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, so this slide has a slightly more detailed overview. You don't need to understand it in this much detail. But for those of you that like and or need to understand things, this shows it in a little bit more detail. Um, so bear with me. This is what you need to know for the exam. But if you want to understand it, this can help you understand it. So in this cell here, right, this is the 2N cell in interphase. You have four chromosomes, two pairs of chromosomes. Right? So you have two short chromosomes, two long chromosomes, um, two gray, two red. So from the chromosomes from the two different parents. Before meiosis, the chromosomes replicate themselves. So now the chromosomes take on that X shape that we're used to talking about. So you still have four chromosomes, but each chromosome now has two chromatids. So you've got eight chromatids there. You've got eight copies of each original chromosome. Eight copies, oh, eight, yeah, bear. Um, two copies of each original chromosome, excuse me. Eight total chromosomes. Uh, so in the first meiotic division, the chromatids do not separate. So these replicated chromosomes stay intact, and you simply divide the number of chromosomes in half. So you see here, this cell gets a long chromosome and a short chromosome. This cell gets a long chromosome and a short chromosome. And they don't keep the original maternal and paternal chromosomes separate. They all just get mixed together. Then in the second meiotic division, um, these chromatids are going to separate. So this cell is going to produce this one and that one. And this cell is going to produce this one and that one. So like this half of this chromosome ended up here. The other half of this chromosome ended up there. This half of this chromosome ended up here. And this half of that chromosome ended up there. Um, so that's more the mechanics. So meiosis one, first meiotic division, you divide up the chromosomes, cut the chromosome number in half. Um, or, or the yeah, so the chromatome chromosomes separate. Uh, I'm just going to stop there because I'll keep over explaining it. Um, if you want a nice video explanation of it, I have embedded the explanation of meiosis from our friend Hank Green, who does Crash Course. Um, this is from Crash Course Biology, not Crash Course Anatomy and Physiology. Um, then there's that extra level of mixing that I wanted to talk about. Um, so this is called synapsis. Synapsis is the name of the process that allows for mixing or recombination of genes. What it happens is that homologous chromosomes pair up at metaphase of meiosis one. So this means mom's number one, pairs up next to dad's number one, they get real close to each other, get all tangled up, and they form a structure called a tetrad. Um, while the chromosome is in, or while the two chromosomes are in this tightly intermingled structure, 
they are going to swap or exchange pieces of chromosome. Each individual exchange event is called crossing over. What this leads to is new combinations of genes or new genetic recombination. Um, so instead of the each of the chromosomes you hand off being one of your father's chromosomes or one of your mother's chromosomes, all of the chromosomes that you turn on to your turn on pass on to your progeny are each one a combination of your original maternal and paternal chromosomes. So you're just shuffling the deck a little bit more um, and changing, right? Because um, each chromosome represents a set of genes or a set of different traits, what you're doing is ensuring that the traits each migrate more independently. So the hair color that you represent or that you inherit isn't necessarily physically tied to your eye color. Um, even two traits on the same chromosome can end up being assorted independently when making egg and sperm because the chromosomes are going to swap pieces of DNA. Um, so just to make it a little bit more clear, let's say here's one of mom's chromosomes in like the X phase and then We'll just use gray for the, here's the other parent. Whoops, I messed it up. Now we can do it this way, wah, wah. And let's just say that you're gonna get a break here. Oh, there we go, that's crayon. It doesn't work very well, um, sorry. Make a break here and a break here. And then these two are going to swap. So then this chromosome right here, you're going to have that long piece and that short piece. And then for this chromosome here, um, this long piece ends up attached to that short piece and this short piece ends up attached to that long piece. Um, so this happens many times along both chromosomes. So all of the chromosomes that you end up passing on to your offspring in actuality all look something like this. So they're all a total recombination of the original maternal and paternal chromosomes that you inherited from your parents. Um, and again, it's just producing more genetic variation um, because that's that's what fuels evolution. The more variability there is within a population, that leads to variable fitness in the population um, so that some people are going to be better adapted to a current environment than others. But as that environment changes, there might be people in the population or organisms in the population that are better adapted to deal with those changes. Um, so the more variability you have in your population, the more mixing there is of your gene pool, that makes your population stronger or better able to adapt to changes. Um, so next up, spermatogenesis. So now this is specifically talking about how meiosis works in sperm. And we're gonna try and keep the terminology that we need to commit to memory to a minimum. The first thing we want to know is this stem cell. Um, so this right here is a spermatogonium. It is a 2N stem cell, which means what it does is goes through mitosis and produces a spermatocyte. So this cell is going to commit itself to meiosis. The other progeny cell is going to retain its spermatogonium identity and go through mitosis again. So this is a self-replacing mitotically active population that keeps producing cells that can then take on a different developmental pathway. And then all we're going to care about is that the spermatogonium is going to make spermatocytes and the spermatocytes when they're done with mitosis 
are going to be spermatids. Um, and we can consider spermatid and spermatozoa separate because, I don't know, it's really not that interesting. Um, so we'll leave it at that. Spermatogonia produce spermatocytes. Spermatocytes become spermatids or sperm. Um, and remembering that the spermatogonia are 2n and the spermatids are n. Um, then we have this additional cell, which I have tried to diagram and make understandable to you, called the sustentacular cells. Um, so when you're looking at um, the micrograph up here, uh, a lot of what you're looking at is actually the cytoplasm of sustentacular cells. I've drawn like four of them down here and they line the whole circumference of the seminiferous tubule. I didn't have, to have time to put in a whole complete row of Sertoli cells because I was doing all of this in PowerPoint and it's a pain in the butt. Um, so they have two important functions. One is that they serve as support cells for the developing spermatocytes as they are going to become spermatids. Um, and a lot of what they do is pick up the excess cytoplasm that the developing spermatids are going to shed as they become fully morphologically mature spermatocytes. Um, the other important thing that the sustentacular cells do is form what is called the blood testis barrier. So you will note I put in here that goofy little orange arrow, that is supposed to represent a tight junction um, so that you might have blood vessels outside of your seminiferous tubules, um, but you don't have any blood vessels inside your seminiferous tubules. And because of those tight junctions, there's no way for immune cells or immune molecules like antibodies to get from the bloodstream into the part of the seminiferous tubule where there might be developing sperm. The reason why this is important is because sperm do not exist until puberty and your immune system is learning. It has to actually be programmed. Um, it's learning what proteins, what uh, molecules are supposed to be in the cell and being programmed to ignore those things. If um, your immune system should happen to come into contact with sperm specific proteins, these would be proteins that your immune system has never seen before and it would theoretically be able to generate an immune response against your sperm and either kill them or render them inactive by having all sorts of antibodies stick to the surface of them. So because your sperm are late to the game and your immune system has not been clued into the fact that they're kind of useful, you have to keep your immune system separate from your sperm. The two cannot come into contact and the sustentacular cells make sure that that happens. So then we have to talk about the hormones that control spermatogenesis. Um, and in males, it's pretty straightforward. You will see when we get into um, the female reproductive cycle, it's a little bit more complicated, dare I say interesting. I think that it's complicated makes it more fun. Um, so for in males, at the beginning of puberty, and we will go over later um, sort of what that trigger is, the hypothalamus decides it is time to start making sperm, so the hypothalamus will produce gonadotropin releasing hormone or GnRH. This will travel through our friend the pituitary portal vein and hit the anterior pituitary which is then going to make follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. They are named for what they do in the female reproductive cycle so their name will not mu make much sense given their male functionality. Um, so then, right, they are going to go everywhere because they enter the bloodstream, but when they end up in the testes, um, the LH is going to cause the interstitial cells to release testosterone. At the same time, 
FSH, here's number four, is causing your sustentacular cells to secrete androgen binding protein. What this does is bind the testosterone, which makes sure that the testosterone stays concentrated in the seminiferous tubules. And it is the testosterone that is going to drive spermatogenesis in the seminiferous tubules. At the same time, um, and I don't know if FSH causes this to happen or LH, um, but your gonadotropins cause the release of inhibin, and inhibin along with testosterone negatively feeds back on the release of FSH and LH so that they don't get too high. Um, this is not an essay question on the exam, um, so concentrate on what each individual hormone does in each individual circumstance and don't worry about being able to tell the whole story. Um, so now we are moving on to gametogenesis in females. Um, the gametes are called oocytes. So the process of producing them is called oogenesis. Um, some people say oogenesis, but I can't bring myself to say oo. So I say oo. Uh, so this takes place, as it says here, in the ovaries, um, and there's an extra sort of layer of terminology to remember. Um, so the sperm um, have their sustentacular cells that support them. Ovaries have a whole structure around them. Well, not ovaries. Oocytes have a whole structure around them, a couple of different cell types that form what is called the follicle. Um, and so what we're going to do is start off by just talking about what is happening to the oocyte as it progresses through the stage of meiosis. Then we're going to layer on top of that what's happening to the follicle. Um, but we're, the emphasis is going to be on the oocyte, not so much the follicle, because I don't want to overcomplicate things. Um, but I also want you to be aware of the full truth. Um, all right, so oogenesis. This this is where things get interesting. Um, so the first cool, interesting thing about oogenesis is that it starts during the fetal period. So the oogonia, which are analogous to the spermatogonia, are the two end stem cells that are going through mitosis, producing what are going to become oocytes, and then also replenishing your stores of oogonia. However, they are done with mitosis by the time a female is born. So all of the oogonia and all of their progeny cells by the time of birth have all committed to meiosis. They are developmentally um, locked down. They are doing meiosis and they are now called primary oocytes that are stuck in prophase of the first meiotic division. Um, so females are born with all of these primary oocytes that have actually initiated meiosis, but have hit the pause button early on prophase one. So then here, following birth at puberty, um, some or many oocytes start to develop um, but only one gets to finish. I don't know how the competition works, um, but on average, or most of the time, one oocyte finishes the first meiotic division um, and produces what is called a secondary oocyte. And instead of producing another oocyte, like when you go through mitosis, you get four sperm, right? You only want one egg a month. Um, so you don't need four fully viable meiotic end products. So when they go through these meiotic divisions, they are asymmetrical. One of the progeny cells will receive most of the cytoplasm. The other will receive just a little bit of cytoplasm. Um, and when we call it a polar body, um, it can go through the second meiotic division, but it does not always. Um, but at any rate, we know um, every cycle during puberty 
one of your primary oocytes completes the first meiotic division and becomes a secondary oocyte plus a polar body. Um, that secondary oocyte is what's ovulated. That is what gets released into the fallopian or eustachian or ovarian, not eustachian tube. Um, wow. Uh, fallopian or oviduct or ovarian tube. Too many names for things. Um, so this secondary oocyte is arrested in metaphase of meiosis 2 um, and will only complete meiosis if it has been fertilized by a sperm. So once it is fertilized by a sperm, it very quickly finishes up its uh, second meiotic division to produce the fully mature ovum or egg along with a second or third polar body depending on whether or not this first polar body actually goes through with the second division. Um, so that is oogenesis. Um, to review, you are born with primary oocytes. Every cycle one of those primary oocytes completes the first meiotic division and becomes a secondary oocyte. That is what is ovulated. Only when that ovulated secondary oocyte is fertilized does it finish meiosis and become an ovum. So now we layer on top of that the follicle. What's going on with the support cells that are around this sort of meiotically progressing oocyte? Um, and again, I've tried to eliminate terminology where I can. I don't think anybody's going to expect you to have mastered follicular development by the time you're done with this class. So we are just going to say that you are born with primordial follicles. Um, every cycle, some of them go through this developmental process. One of them becomes a tertiary follicle. Um, and this is what the follicle looks like just prior to ovulation. Um, we also call tertiary follicles vesicular follicles. This is the term I am more familiar with. So it's probably the one you will hear me say more often than not. Um, before we get to ovulation, I have this slide here, which I just want to explain a little bit. Um, it overlays where we are in follicular development with meiosis. I don't anticipate asking a lot of questions on the exam about this, but for those of you that are curious, right, this is how it works. So you're born with primary oocytes arrested in meiosis 1. Those primary oocytes are in primordial follicles. And then as that primary oocyte progresses through that first meiotic division, the follicle is progressing through primary, secondary, tertiary follicle development. Um, but again, we don't care about primary, secondary follicles. We care you, you're born with primordial, they become tertiary, right? and then when the tertiary follicle erupts, what it kicks out is a secondary oocyte. Um, so ovulation coincides with the completion of that first um, meiotic division. Uh, so your follicle as it develops is always containing a primary oocyte. Um, and you don't get a secondary oocyte until right as it's bursting out of the ovary, which we call ovulation, which we have here. Um, so there's one important thing we want to remember about ovulation and we're moving in this direction right to left instead of left to right because of how the original this original figure is put together. Um, so just following ovulation the cells that remain in the ovary right all of these cells here are going to remain it's just this little bit here that gets ejected. So these remaining cells here become the corpus luteum. And you are going to see that that plays an important role in regulating the uterine cycle and feedback and all that kind of crap. Um, so I am going to stop there because that is 35 minutes. 
um, and it is a good place to stop. We want to enter the female menstrual cycle with a well-rested and open mind. It gets complicated, but it's also, I don't know, just kind of cool because it works and anything that is complicated but works nevertheless is interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll see you on the other side.